the slow walk. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fake. Alright, this will be episode 15. Alright, so uh, the scene changes from the last episode, and uh. So it shows an extremely long creature. So is this truth in plain sight? So at first we get bones, and then it starts connecting to a railway. So I'll show the entire scene in one shot. Alright, so it starts here. It could be a Stegosaurus, okay? But now m imagine this as the head of, like, the, uh, the Midgard Serpent. And see God of War 4. Google God of War 4 Midgard Serpent, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Alright, so now imagine this as, like, its head. Okay, or just, like, a head on it that's gone. Alright, now watch. So we, we start first. There's the neck. Okay. Now its body, it opens up into its lungs. Okay, then, you know, its stomach, its esophagus, and then the body keeps going. And keeps going. It keeps going. This is all one creature. Okay, so then here it changes into a railway. So it goes from the bones into a railway. Okay, so... I want you to imagine for a moment that this is just one big creature. Now it keeps going. And it keeps going. And then keeps going and ends. Um, so in my opinion, I, I feel like that's a, uh, a representation of subtly, very subtly, a much bigger creature. Like how in the later movies of Jurassic World, which we will be breaking down, there is that uh, dinosaur that lives in the water. So I think that this is like a foreshadowing, very subtle, of the future and of what's actually out there. Okay, so now they go into this enclosure. This is where their uh, communications are. And we can see right here on the sign it says high voltage, no hands, uh, 10,000 volts. So now the camera moves and you see this dirt, pa dirt pile. It looks like a volcano, La Palma. So then, uh, it shows us the predator's perspective, and they're looking at them through uh, grass. Nick. But also, it's like they're at the top of a pyramid, as though they're the offering. Or the child, right here in this case, is the offering. And the camera goes through the grass to show that they are actually always closer than we think. They're watching, they're waiting, they're literally like lizards. Like a snake waiting to strike. Like how alligators just wait in the water. And they wait and they wait. They're just patient. They just wait. And then they get ready to strike. Alright, so then humans clueless. Nick. And then quickly, without warning, suddenly, striking like a snake. The reptilian humanoid engages. Okay. So immediately, subdues, overpowers, and begins to attack. And then it's just attacking her backpack, she escapes, and then it comes to the realization of that that's not actually her, and now they're face to face with it. And now remember, in the first movie, Dr. Sadler says, the only thing that matters now are the people we love. And so now Malcolm here is luring the reptilian away from his loved ones. Alright, so in this next scene... You can see that three reptilian humanoids uh, are in total. 
Okay? So I've heard about in the desert encounter stories, they always travel in groups of three. Alright? Um, so in this next scene, they cover 50 feet or 16, 16 meters in two seconds. Watch. And then they smash into the door, but it does nothing. It doesn't affect them at all. So now Do Dr. Malcolm's running. And then in this next scene, the uh, reptilian humanoid decides to toy with its food. It can easily catch him, and he's actually uh, injured. He's limping. Instead of just attacking him, it jumps through the window. Instead of just attacking him, it jumps back. Doesn't even jump on him. It could have jumped on him as he was escaping. It intentionally jumps out to scare him. Instead of jumping on him from behind. It's inducing fear. It's walking him down. Looking him in the eye. Look at that. That look of pure terror, pure horror. Hisses at him. And now pushes him through the glass to show that he could easily end him whenever he wants. And he's toying with him. Okay, so he jumps, the reptilian jumps through the glass and it shows that he's unaffected by glass and force, so strong skin and bones. Slams into the door again, like it's nothing. Looks through the glass or the portal, look, look at the eye symbolism. He sees through to the other side. He's traumatized. He's filled with fear. He's anxious. Incredible strength. Now the humans here have uh, intense fear. These are the other reptilians attacking. So, it, in, this, in this next scene, uh, the reptilian is trying to break on through to the other side. It's like something is trying to force its way into our world. And man is sitting there like, oh, fuck. And so now you see, like, the reptilians are like, okay, we can't go through, let's go under. So now they start digging. Remember, I said desert. So now they start digging. So now the humans copy them. The, they start digging to get them. And with intense speed, the humans copy their ideas, but in the other direction, through the back. So now, in this next scene, the, the reptilians uh, outsmart the humans strategically. They're about to escape through the back. The, uh, and the raptor burst through, the reptilian burst through, because they uh, outsmarted the humans, strategically. Now humans climb, that's, that's what we do when we, we have nowhere to go, when uh, we're cornered, we go up. Now Dr. Malcolm sees an opportunity, and he makes a run for uh, better uh, cover. <laughs> But now, as he uh, enters the uh, building, he's uh, met with another reptilian, so he just left danger for more danger. And he's moments away from being 
mutilated, basically. So he climbs. And so now, um, humans are better able to use physics like momentum to outsmart reptilians. You'll see that in the Predator movie, which will also break down with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that he uses momentum and physics to kill the Predator. So in this next scene, the reptilian gets right up into Dr. Malcolm's face, just jumps right up. He's cornered. Now this next scene is powerful. It literally walks right up to him. Like it knows exactly what it's doing. It's looking him in the eye. And hissing in his face. Right, so now this is kind of a little goofy part. It's like, hey, you stand still so that I can kick you out the window and kill you. And impale you through a stake. So a little goofy, but I mean, yay, the heroes win. So if you guys look up the interview from David Icke uh, by Credo Mutwa, M-U-T-W-A, he said the only way to actually kill them, kill a reptilian, was to impale them through the heart with the wood of a teak tree. Impale them with wood? Are they a vampire? Makes you think. So now Ian and uh, his daughter get out of there. Through the door, the other reptilian comes in. Uh, she, uh, Sarah, attempts to escape through the roof. Again, we try to climb to get away. Uh, we jump across the building, and the reptilian pursues. So it shows that they're able to scale and jump buildings in moments. So you have one on the roof now with her, and then one below her waiting. So now she uses, again, she uses physics to outsmart the reptilians. By sliding all the tiles off of the roof with momentum, and then the reptilian falls off the roof. And falls into the presence of the other reptilian. So now this one thought it was going to get a meal, and now this one has interrupted its focus, basically, and shown that its single meal is now having to be shared so he's basically saying back off and then they begin to fight amongst themselves so a wolf pack mentality starts to form so basically they team up wolf pack men, wolf pack mentality is the wolves team up to take down the prey and then after the prey is killed they fight amongst themselves although it's already happening before she's even killed So now she escapes, the main characters escape, the reptilians don't pursue, and the main characters are saved. Saying it's okay, it's over now. So as they're flying away, we see the sign InGen saying, we make your future. Okay, who? Corporations? Reptilians? So in this movie, the reptilians were made by InGen from the first movie. But what if this is blatant truth in plain sight? That they are in control. That they make our future. And then Nick here uh, disarmed the hunter from killing the T-Rex. So he had to put the T-Rex to sleep instead. And uh, even though activists do their best which he prevented him from making him a dead trophy. Now he's an alive trophy. So the corporations always win in the end. And then here he doesn't feel so high and mighty anymore because his best friend died. His friend didn't make it, Ajay. So, he claimed before the greatest predator to ever live is hunted by the second greatest predator to ever live. And he accomplished that. But he's saying it means nothing without the people you love to share it with. And then finally, after all of that, he offers him a job. He says he is done being around the company of death. 
Meaning when you're around these things, when when you dabble in that side of the realm, that's what you encounter. So I think he's trying to tell us that basically nothing ever comes good from having these encounters. And I think that's only partially true. I think that might be like mm, 70% true, and the other 30% I think are the native Terrans that are open to peace and dialogue and interspecies relationships, whatever that means to the individual. So that will wrap up this episode. Thank you for watching.